Okay, this video is William Roberts, MD, and Heart Disease Revisited. So William Roberts is the greatest cardiac pathologist who ever lived. He did many, many thousands and thousands of autopsies of the heart and people who had died from heart attacks and related causes. Um, he had a quantitative method for autopsy of the coronary arteries. So here's the main coronary arteries. There's the right coronary artery, the left main coronary artery. It bifurcates into the left anterior descending LAD and into the left circumflex, abbreviated LCX. And he would measure them at five millimeter increments, and then he would cut them into separate segments at five millimeter intervals. And then he would measure them in cross-section, the amount of atherosclerosis, amount of narrowing. The medical word for narrowing in an artery is called stenosis. So he could then precisely describe the amount of coronary artery stenosis and the location of the coronary artery stenosis. So uh, coronary artery bypass, bypass graft surgery would be like, let's say there was a blockage right here. A bypass graft would go from the ascending thoracic aorta and then bypass the blockage, put an additional tube conduit to get blood distal to the blockage. Okay, theoretically, that sounds fantastic, but here's the catch. What William Roberts found is that atherosclerosis is never just in one segment. It's always diffuse and of similar severity throughout the artery. So you would say, well, so what? Well, that's a big so what. What that means is you can't win the game with a bypass. The atherosclerosis is always diffuse, and it's always in all three coronary arteries. He said the old-fashioned idea of having single-vessel coronary arteries, like let's say you have isolated right coronary, he says that's BS. It's never isolated to one of the coronaries. It's always diffuse. And the typical finding that was that there was atherosclerosis in every single segment, okay? So you can't just bypass one spot and be done. You can't just stent one spot and be done with it. Okay, I'm going to show more examples of what this really means. This, by the way, also was his way of explaining why cardiac calf always underestimates the amount of stenosis, the amount of narrowing in the coronary arteries. Because in cardiac calf, what you're doing is you're estimating the narrowing of one segment by comparing it to the adjacent segment. And the underlying assumption is that the adjacent segment is normal, 100% wide open. <clears throat> so here it is in a side view, and here it is looking at it in cross-sectional cross view, or NFOS. And you can see this is a normal coronary artery, 100% open. But here's the catch. When you assess this, this stenosis right here, which is 75% narrow, 25% residual lumen open on a cardiac cath, you're typically comparing it to an adjacent segment that's also diseased, that's also narrowed by atherosclerosis. So this estimate is going to underestimate the amount of disease. In general, he found that when cardiac cath would say there's 50% stenosis, in reality, at autopsy in the same patient, there was 75% uh, cross-sectional narrowing. So they're not exactly the same stenosis measurements, but the point is made. The amount of atherosclerotic disease was routinely significantly worse at autopsy than it was at cardiac cath. Cardiac cath is the same thing as coronary artery angiogram or coronary angiogram or coronary arteriogram. They're all the same thing. Okay, there are different ways of looking at the amount of coronary artery stenosis. You can do it with IVES, IVES, intravascular ultrasound. That's rarely done. You can do it with a CT angiogram. That's becoming more and more common as well. Okay, but the most common things are this um, uh, cardiac cath and uh, autopsy, okay, as far as we're concerned for this paper. So a 75, so 50% narrowing at cardiac cath corresponded to 75% cross-sectional narrowing at autopsy. A 75% narrowing at cardiac cath corresponded to 95% cross-sectional area narrowing at autopsy. Um, an 88% uh, cardiac cath stenosis corresponded to 98% narrowing at uh, autopsy, so that's bad. Okay. Now here is the picture of William Roberts. He's an old guy. He's dead now, but you know he's the greatest cardiac pathologist who ever lived. And he was out in Texas. You know, Texas used to be very, very famous for its um, cardiac surgery. And Tabaki was out there as well. And he wrote lots of papers, did lots of research. He's a real hard work and smart guy. But he is an old timer. He did not know about the vegan diet. He was starting to learn about a plant-based diet. Um, he himself took statins. I think he might have been a spokesperson for one of the statin companies because he was very 
enthusiastically promoting statins, which to me seemed kind of insane. But also back in those days, they didn't know as much about the side effects of statin. Statin drugs have a lot of side effects. They're mitochondrial inhibitors. They increase your risk of diabetes. They increase your risk of dementia. Um, and there's other potential significant uh, side effects, muscle pain, muscle weakness, uh, rhabdomyolysis. Yeah. Who needs that? You can almost always <clears throat> get your cholesterol under control just by eating a low-fat vegan diet with no oil. Why wouldn't you do that? Okay, um, he made other good points that atherosclerosis is consistent with a blood clot. You know, you can also call that an organizing hematoma. Okay, it'll get uh, little clot, little channels of patency recanalizing through the clot like you would see in a chronic pulmonary embolism blood clot. You'll get laminations of it as you characteristically see of ongoing thrombosis and uh, thrombolysis within the clot, like a tree stump, rings of a tree type of appearance. Um, you get the immune system cells move in there and they put in a lot of fibrosis. All of that is characteristic of atherosclerosis. Okay, here is his landmark paper. This is the greatest paper ever written in the history of research about the coronary artery disease. Uh, his 50 years of experience comparison, comparing autopsies on all kinds of cardiac death, you know, acute myocardial infarction, arrhythmia, um, unstable angina, patients with other diseases who died, and then what did their heart look like? So he compared all these things and tried to answer the basic questions about what is coronary artery disease all about. Um, and I think some of his most important observations was that it's never in one vessel. It's never in one spot. It's always diffuse through all three coronaries. And again, what does it mean? So here would be like cross-sectional atherosclerotic plaque. What that means is you can't win the game with one, two, three, four, even five bypasses. It's everywhere. The atherosclerosis is everywhere. Only a systemic treatment can work, something that goes throughout your blood vessels, every little millimeter of your blood vessels. And there's only two things that do that, medication and drugs. But as we well know, the medications don't work that well, okay? And just because you lower your total cholesterol to 150 with a statin, that you don't get the same benefit as if you had lowered it by diet, okay? I got lots of internal medicine friends who tell me their patients on statins don't do as well as you would think based on the numbers. And that might in part be, of course, because it's increasing their risk of diabetes and a bunch of other complications, okay? Now we'll talk a little bit about some of the other things that he said. Um, he said in his experience, it's probably about one out of 500 patients will have a genetic problem that increases their risk of elevated blood cholesterol. And, you know, Esselstyn had said if patients follow his diet, they usually do very well, even if they've got uh, some other problem. Um, the vast majority of atherosclerotic plaque was primarily fibrous tissue, like a blood clot that's getting replaced by the immune system and forming scar tissue. Fibrous tissue means like scar tissue. And you would also see some fat, cholesterol, pultaceous debris in there, some calcifications. It was always diffuse. Single vessel disease is a myth. Okay, that greatly limits the benefit that you can achieve with a stent or a cabbage coronary artery bypass graft. That's an important statement. You want to know that. That's a game changer. Coronary artery disease is always diffuse, always diffuse. Single vessel coronary artery disease is a myth. Single vessel coronary artery disease is a myth. You cannot win the game with just cabbage or stenting. Okay, um, let's see, what else did he say? In herbivore animals, including monkeys, rabbits, etc., he says it's very easy to induce atherosclerosis. Just feed them a high-fat diet. You know, he especially was focused on saturated fat. You know, he came out of the Ansel Keys days. He's an old guy. Um, he does have a YouTube channel, William C. Roberts. Uh, his most recent video on there that I had seen before was 2009. And I laugh because this guy's the best cardiac pathologist to ever live. And, you know, you'll go to his videos and there'll be like hardly any views, 36 views. Okay. He says that cholesterol is the only essential thing needed for atherosclerosis. He felt that atherosclerosis was by far... Uh, the most important thing for causing coronary artery atherosclerosis, that elevated blood cholesterol was the most important thing by far. He said cigarette smoke's a risk factor, but nowhere near as important as cholesterol. He said you could blow smoke in a mouse's face all day, and it won't get coronary artery atherosclerosis. One interesting point was, you know, the Japanese were smoking like chimneys back in the 1960s, and also eating very high uh, amounts of sodium. 
and they did not get that much coronary artery disease. They did get a lot of hypertension, and they had a lot of intracranial atherosclerosis, and they had a lot of strokes, but they didn't get as much coronary artery disease for whatever the reason. I'm not exactly completely sure why coronary artery disease is a little bit different than is intracranial atherosclerosis. They even call intracranial atherosclerosis Asian atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease Western atherosclerosis. But the Westerners, the big difference was they ate the high-fat diets. Okay, um, what else? He said that there's no evidence that raising LD HDL cholesterol level is beneficial, but there's lots of evidence that lowering LDL cholesterol level is beneficial. Um, I would say, you know, you can get a myocardial infarction even if you don't have high blood cholesterol, if you're on statins, if you got sickle cell anemia, if you have a severe infection, if you've been taking EPO and your hematocrit's too high, anything that increases the likelihood the blood's going to thrombose will increase the risk of, of uh, coronary artery disease. That's like Gregory Sloop knowledge there. Um, you know, Dr. William Roberts was fantastic, but he, you know, he didn't know modern blood hemorrheology. He didn't know anything. I never heard him mention zeta potential, blood viscosity, Rouleau formation, bridging molecules, blood stuff, none of that stuff. So he really had not read much about blood uh, physiology and pathophysiology. I was kind of surprised by that, but he had not. Okay. Um, he does recognize, as I said, that atherosclerosis is a blood clot. It's laminated, it recanalizes, etc. cetera. Um, let's see, what else did he say? Well, that's about it for what William Roberts had to say. And still, it's a, it's a magnificent paper. It's a landmark game changer in atherosclerosis and coronary artery disease. And, you know, we know the best thing to prevent atherosclerosis is like the Esselstyn diet. I do think Esselstyn has gone off a little, the deep end a little bit with this nonsense about flax. I think that's a mistake. Um, you know, flax, I think, was, I think it was ignorant of him to be pressured into doing that. I think he's a little bit of a one-trick pony. You know, his papers showed that the low-fat vegan diet reversed atherosclerosis. And I can at least see a rationale for the eat greens six times a day in the high-risk patients to get the more nitric oxide. But I cannot see a good rationale for the flax. I've heard some people say, I think it was Esselstyn, you get more fiber, you get more omega-3s, but that's irrelevant. That's not going to change the progress of coronary artery disease. And as a matter of fact, uh, omega-3 supplements increase the risk of atrial fibrillation. Okay, they're obesogenic, diabetogenic. I would not recommend them. All types of fat eventually increase the risk of atherosclerosis, so I would not recommend that. Anyways, the very low fat, low sodium, 100% organic, whole foods only, 100% vegan, no caffeine, no alcohol, uh, helps to prevent and reverse coronary artery disease. Um, that's the main thing, and we talked about this other stuff before. Manage your stress, get your exercise, get your sunshine, get your sleep, maintain your social relationships, etc. It's good to be religious. They're all healthier. So let's see. Let's see if I got any more slides here. Oh, yeah. I just want to talk about one more thing. I'm going to talk about what is called a ramus intermedius. So normally you have the ascending thoracic aorta. The left main coronary artery comes off that one. And then that gives rise to a bifurcation, the left circumflex artery and the left anterior descending artery. Atherosclerotic plaque in this vessel, the left main, is called the widow maker. And they often exaggerate it to pressure people into getting uh, open heart surgery. Okay, That's what they said to my dad. Mitulu said in his experience they routinely use it as a sales pitch. Okay, well, here's the point of this slide, that some people, probably about 20% overall, but up to 30, you know, 32%. I've read papers like the next one I'm going to show you where there's over 30% of patients, 32% in the upcoming paper, where they've got a ramus intermediate. So it's a trifurcation anatomy of the left main coronary artery. This is significant. It causes more turbulent flow at the left main uh, split, bifurcation, trifurcation, and that increase in turbulent flow increases atherosclerosis in the distal left main coronary artery as well as the origin of the left circumflex and the left anterior descending. Okay, so that can be a big deal. And what I'm trying to say is you should assume you have the unfavorable anatomy and thus follow your you know, low-fat vegan diet, no oil, 100%. To lower your risk, don't half-ass it. In my experience, people who half-ass things and say things like, well, I'm cutting down on oil, I'm cutting down on meat, they don't do so well. Okay. Whereas the ones who say, yes, I'm following the diet, I want to be successful, they do really well. Okay, that's been the experience that I've heard from Dr. Esselstyn as well. Dr. Esselstyn says any patient that follow his diet, he never seen any of them have a cardiovascular event, the ones who actually followed it. Um, and I've also heard Dr. Ornish say the people who followed his diet, even if they still had a little bit elevated cholesterol, they tended to do well. Here's the paper 
about the ramus intermedius. In this paper, 32% had a ramus intermedius anatomy, meaning a trifurcation of the left main coronary artery, and it caused increased atherosclerosis in the left main 8.5 fold, that's a lot, left anterior descending 3.7 fold, that's a lot, left circumflex increased atherosclerosis by three times, so it caused a major increase in atherosclerosis in its, in its vicinity at that trifurcation site. So assume you have the unfavorable anatomy and you'll just be more meticulous about optimizing your diet and lifestyle and you'll thus dramatically lower your risk. So hope that was helpful.